Good evening and welcome to our webinar on livestock and forage management strategies in dry conditions. My name is Dean Dick. I'm a farm management specialist at the Ag Info Center and I will be moderating this webinar tonight. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So if you uh, want to watch it later, you'll receive a link in an email tomorrow and uh, then you can watch it at your leisure. Uh, secondly, if you want to ask a question, uh, take a look and uh, you should see a question panel on your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. So type in your questions and uh, we will uh, take them after the, the presentations are done. Uh, and I'll uh, read them out to our um, presenters. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, start uh, start the webinar. I'll introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Diane Westerland. Uh, she is the manager with uh, CARA. And our second speaker will be Grant Lestuka. He's a forage extension specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Diane to start uh, our webinar. Okay, thanks, Dean. Uh, as Dean mentioned, I'm uh, with the Chinook Applied Research Association down in the special areas and our headquarters in Oyen, and we're t we were very much feeling the, the dry conditions this spring. And uh, we followed up with uh, Grant's presentation uh, when I get mine wrapped up. So what on earth was Mother Nature doing this spring to us? Um, it was some extremely dry conditions that uh, that we're trying to battle through, but really not not more than just a, a not so gentle reminder for, for what's often normal in the semi-arid parts of the province, such as we are here down in the special areas. A little on the extreme side this spring, um, we've been told it's, it's uh, a hundred year, dr uh, the driest spring we've had in roughly a hundred years, but not all that unusual for us. Uh, this is a picture from back in the early 2000s when uh, things looked pretty grim out here as well. So we typically think of ourselves in these drier areas as, you know, we're always looking forward to next year, but the rea reality is we're really last year's country. What management practices and what happens in the current year very much influences what next year's going to look like. And uh, when, we're, when we have the opportunity to to have some carryover in our pastures, um, we're rewarded with some some green growth uh, because of that that thatch and the the moisture saving and and just that better environment for some new growth to uh, to get us through the current year. Unfortunately, this 2019 was kind of the perfect bad scenario. Uh, most of us are following up with extremely dry conditions uh, in 2018, which resulted in lots of pastures being um, severely overworked. Uh, some people hadn't made adjustments in cow numbers because just a few years ago we had excellent growing conditions um, for several years in a row and lots of uh, cow numbers were increased because we had that extra forage to graze and also the expectation that it's going to get better next year. So we maybe didn't make some of the adjustments that uh, would have prevented or presented a better scenario for us this spring. And unfortunately, we didn't have much snow over the 2018-19 uh, winter, followed by a pretty cold spring. Feed prices were extremely high, and it ended up ma very majority of, of cattle producers had low or no feed reserves um, at the end of the, this past winter's feeding season. And then we were um, faced with no rain until late June, just in the last couple weeks. So what now? When we're dealing with those pastures that... Um, that needs some time to to uh, to regrowth. What's our what's our best options or, or a few ideas to uh, to help us get through that? I'm certainly not a uh, um, have all the answers and and just a few ideas that we're going to share with you this evening. Uh, stress pastures need time to recover. The the rain that we've had in the last couple of weeks and and hopefully that will continue is still not going to bring that pasture production up to what we, we consider normal or average in 2000 for this to current growing season. The pastures need more more than just rain, they need time and just an opportunity to rest and get that regrowth. And we look at our pastures as a long-term resource. They're not just something we use today and not worry about down the road because they're perennials and, and uh, often our, our native pastures in particular, we have to have patience and, and uh, look after them for the long, the long run. So just a few ideas on, on how we can take some of the pressure off of those pastures. 
Um, and we're almost probably getting to the point of maybe being a bit too late on delaying the turn-in dates because lots of people just don't have other options. But um, the longer you can delay going into those native pastures in particular, just gives you more grazing um, at the other end of the grazing season. So um, that time to, to get some growth and and just provide that material for the for the cows to so that they're not chewing off the tops and damaging the roots at the same time. Um, some other options are are grazing underutilized areas. And for for much of us in in this um, part of the province, there's more extensive grazing than there is um, small paddock. Uh, rotational grazing. So often in these extensive pastures there's areas that the cows just don't typically go into and uh, especially in years where there's lots of moisture some of those areas are just you know there's 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 going to be some carryover growth. So if if you can get those cows moved into those areas and and utilize some of that growth will take the pressure off the areas where they they typically graze and 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 some of that green give that green growth a chance. Some of these areas are often farther from water and um, often there's the fences aren't there to, to hold them in. So how can we get them to, to utilize some of those areas? Um, one technique is uh, salt placement and I'm sure this isn't something that's a, a new concept for, for many of you. Salt is often used as um, drawing cattle into different parts of a pasture. It can also be used to, to help get rid of some um, problem areas such as buckbrush, uh, just because they'll end up trampling some of that out. But, you know, disperse the salt away from the water and into those areas where there might be some forage material that could be utilized. Um, often water can be a restricting factor in some of those areas. So if there's any possibilities of, of setting up uh, temporary troughs or possibly some overground uh, piping to, to get water to those areas uh, might be an option. And also the use of fencing, looking at uh, either electric fencing just to hold hold those cattle cattle into some of those areas that maybe are underutilized. And if you've got kids with that uh, are looking for something to do this summer and some horses that need some work, um, there's always the possibility of of herding cows into to those areas as well. And with the benefit of maybe having some uh, well broke horses at the end of the summer. Another option, and I know this has been utilized by, by several this spring, is grazing hayland. And sometimes our, our current situation uh, for hay in, in some of the dry areas is that it, there isn't growth sufficient even for cutting, but it might be enough uh, to get some, some uh, grazing days out of. A few cautions though, when you're moving into to hayland, um, especially uh, mixes that are containing uh, lots of alfalfa or maybe clovers, Potential for bloat is something uh, you need to be be cautious of. Um, there's products like AlphaSure to, you know, that or bloat guard to help um, relieve some of that pressure. Um, hope, and ideally, if you've got some uh, non-bloat legumes like Sandpoint in the mix, um, that might help you get through the bloat potential. When cattle go into an area that uh, and they're hungry, um, that's probably when your your risk is the highest, and when the the alfalfa is um, is less mature uh, can co potentially cause some problems there and have to be careful too because I think you know our hay production uh, are can be looked at as a long-term resource as well so you don't want it to um, put so much grazing pressure that that you're harming the the productivity of the hay in the long term although because it's off as, as a reseeded forage um, the, the opportunities for rejuvenating that uh, are probably a little uh, easier to manage than uh, with native pastures. Another option is is looking at cropland as a forage source and these are, and I'm meaning annual crops here. Uh, this is a shot of some yearlings um, that I took just last week uh, just northeast of Medicine Hat and uh, these yearlings were turned in into a, pa a, a, a crop that actually looked better than many of the crops uh, throughout the area but uh, this uh, manager took advantage of the opportunity that there was some some forage material there before it got too mature that they weren't that interested in it and got some grazing days out of that. And it might be something to if you you know if you don't have access within your own operation on uh, some annual cropping, talk to, to your cropper neighbors. There's lots of crops that look as poor as as this and, and even worse that are probably going to be more value 
valuable as a forage crop than they are going to be as a grain crop um, at the end of the year here. So um, it might be an opportunity to, to create some partnerships with those cropping neighbours. And I guess uh, another option is just finding pasture elsewhere. Um, fortunately, this uh, the extreme conditions aren't everywhere in the province. So, so there are some some um, counties that do have have had sufficient moisture and may have some some grazing resources that are being underutilized. So, um, again, search out through your through the communication uh, sources and and see where there might be some grazing. It doesn't come without cost, though. Um, you know, these trucks don't come free, and and there is definitely some other things to consider. Uh, when you are leasing pasture, um, and just a few tips, make sure you get an agreement in writing and that spells out kind of who's responsible for what. Understand what species uh, your cattle are going into. Um, we've heard of a few few people who've taken cattle from these uh, hard grass areas out west into to areas where the pasture is quite lush. Uh, those cows never lay down and chew their cud because they're they're just not used to to those high high um, water volume forages so something that just to, to be aware of um, also fencing make sure that you know there is fences in place and and if not if and who's responsible for looking after those fences because if the pastures are three or four hours away from where you are um, it's not that easy just to run up and, and check and of course uh, make sure you understand the economics so that there's not a big surprise at the the end of the summer and and uh, bills have to be paid Another option with, with uh, cattle on pasture is to supplement. And uh, generally, we'd be looking at a high protein or, or high energy source. Um, it could be in the form of bales, if you can find them, uh, possibly pellets. And even creep feeding the calves will take a bit of pressure off that grass. Again, though, not without some cautions. Um, the, with the cost of bales, um, it can be be a pretty big investment to, to feed a lot of cattle or to supplement a lot. And also be careful that you're not bringing in weeds. Um, often forages that are, especially ones that are maybe haven't been utilized first in, in, in some other operations that they might be of poor quality and, and contain some weeds, which might be hard to manage, particularly on native pastures. Um, in, a, in a reseeded pasture or an introduced species pasture, managing those weeds might be a little bit easier. And how are you going to distribute that feed? Is it rolled out? Is it in feeders? Um, and in choosing the the um, class of livestock that's your best option to receive that supplement. Is it you know yearlings, cow calf pairs, um, and w as and a decision of of where you put that mat material in in a pasture. It might just mean uh, designating a sacrifice area because it's going to get trampled, and you're going to end up with uh, other potential issues. So rather than spreading uh, bales throughout the pasture, you might want to just designate an area that um, is, is the best fit to receive those feeds from outside the area. And if you're currently leasing land, sometimes there's restrictions in that lease agreement as to introducing um, new forages or, or potential weeds uh, into the area. Um, another option um, is just selling down cows and culling hard. Uh, we have neighbors who've, who've already made those decisions and, and there's been pairs going to market. I think the Veteran, Veteran uh, Dryland Trading Corporation had quite a number of pairs in today's sale as well. Just people just downscaling so that they can meet their, their forage resources. So be str strategic in, in making those decisions. Um, you know, get a really good understanding of what your current resources can handle. Do you need to sell today? Um, is it can it can it be delayed? Um, and with those resources, be thinking about today, but also the next growing season as well. Do the economics. Um, you know, the the sales versus what it costs to to maintain the rest, and making decisions on on that sell down. You've got lots of of re, um, sort of uh, check marks as to, to decisions on, on who goes. You can look at productivity, age of the animal, um, attitude. This might be the time to get rid of the, the bad actors in the in the group. And then just general health, bad bags, bad feet, 
would typically be the first to go. And also think about the future of your herd. It most majority of us have developed a herd based on, um, you know, selection of, of, of genetics that, you know, we want to, to maintain for the long term. So in that sort of strategic look at, at paring down, you know, kind of make sure that you're thinking about the future and that you're able to maintain the basic herd that you want, if at all possible. Another option is just dry lotting those cows, um, and it just depends for sure where that feed uh, sources might be. Um, we're hearing cows booked into some feedlots for the fall at um, well over three dollars a day, and and that might be very conservative if um, you know with the way it looks as as not a lot of of hay. So. Um, be careful on, I guess, just a good understanding of what those economics are and know to what that ration is that, that wherever the destination uh, feedlot is, is it something that, that uh, you are comfortable with and does it even work if you're trying to move pairs at this point, point in the summer? Um, so I guess, you know, it's making that plan and, and looking at all the options, what all your resources are and just kind of understanding uh, what um, what's the best use of the current resources you've got, the economics you have available, and, and packaging that up and, and moving ahead. Um, it's always easy to, to um, give advice to plan ahead, and, and it's not as always as easy to, to carry through when, when we're reacting to a, a big problem like the dry conditions of this year. Um, we recognize, though, it is a, a really stressful time. So... Um, and we want to reduce the stress as much as possible for the cattle. Um, uh, performance is reduced if there is stress. So even things like managing pest control, um, flies and stuff for the summer might reduce the pressure on the pastures a little bit as well. Another point to, um, the, the, another tip that I guess that lots of people use is, is weaning early. Those cows, when their calves are, are off, are going to require less nutrition and volume than they do when the calves are, are on the cows. Um, a couple other things I'll mention just uh, for, for um, when you're looking at, at uh, those pastures and, and trying to make sure that you have them as a long-term resource. In dry conditions, um, invasive weeds can, can really become a problem. Uh, the, the often the dryness is just an opens a door for an opportunity for, for weeds to take hold. Uh, go for whole mounds, uh, dug out spoil piles, bringing in outside feed that, that contains weed seeds, and some of those trampling areas when it's dry, they just don't, uh, the, it's easy to, to kill out the, the grass and just opens a door for um, various weeds. So it's a good idea to get to know and, and recognize some of the potential uh, problem weeds and uh, get on them right away so that they don't become a long-term problem. Uh, poisonous plants can, can become a problem uh, in these dry conditions because cows are moving from areas that they typically graze into those lower areas that maybe even held water the last few years. And so they're, now they're going into those areas because they're green and that's where some of these plants uh, tend to, to, ha to habitate. And, the cows typically aren't grazing them, but now they're they're kind of being pushed into them. So just a few to watch for um, seaside arrowgrass. Uh, several years ago, up in in this area, there were several uh, cattle lost due to consumption of of the seaside arrowgrass. Another one is death camas, uh, larkspur, and uh, local weed. And I know there's a few others, but uh, just to kind of keep your eyes open when you're touring the pastures. Some other issues that can happen under these dry conditions are deterioration in, in water quality. And these shots were taken, of course, when we had some, uh, some really good growing conditions uh, a few years back. But as we get drier, there's more and more pressure on these surface water um, sources and the, the quality can deteriorate rapidly. Uh, several of you, you'll remember uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was over 200 head lost from one uh, water source in Saskatchewan just because the, the level had dropped, the concentration of sulfates had become so high that the, the cattle just couldn't, um, it just was, it, they, it killed them. So something to really watch for. We had a number of samples come through um, the care of 
here over the last couple of summers and and we did to have a, a few samples that were quite high in sulfates and and recommendations from the water specialist was that they needed to look at some alternative sources because it was becoming risky to to water cattle plus there's the physical issues um you know if especially if they're wading into the, to the dugouts uh, ideally you want to be pulling water out so the cattle aren't uh, going into them and also just damage to to the riparian areas. Uh, there's just more pressure on on those water holes when when we're dry and less uh, resilience of the area around them for recovery. So we end up trampling, uh, killing out vegetation, and and some of those issues become long-term management problems. Uh, and one of the the important options I think for for forage. Um, and grazing use are the annual crops, and I think having the best potential for creating the most pounds of forage. Uh, the applied research associations throughout the province have been working on trials with the annual forages, and and have each of the of your local associations will have information on on some of the varieties that might uh, give you some bang for your buck. Even though we're getting late for seeding some of, some of these crops, um, they're probably better than. Uh, a less mature crop might be be better forage than than nothing. Um, Grant is going to create or present uh, a lot more information on on using some of these. Um, this is just a shot of some mixes, and then on the left hand side are some millets, which in some of the work we've done here have been very productive. Uh, they're warm season crops and and can grow well in the heat of the summer as long as they've got a little bit of moisture. So, like I said, Grant will be addressing that in detail. Um, this is just uh, a reminder of, of the associations that are, are spread throughout the province. And majority of us have done quite a bit of work with forages over the years and, and grazing. So uh, a, a good local source for information. Um, some other resources, um, the Ag Info Centre uh, is, is your connection to a number of specialists. Uh, the Beef Cattle Research Centre website. Um, also has a, a really good um, source of all kinds of information there. Saskatchewan Ag Knowledge Centre and and some of the others uh, listed on this sheet related to the stress side because we we this is a very stressful time for for those of us wanting to to maintain these cow herds and and figuring out how we're going to get through to the end of the year, let alone into the following year. So um, I think the one thing to remember is that that we cannot control the weather, Mother Nature has the, the upper hand there, but uh, we can help ourselves by by getting whatever information we can find, talking to others, and uh, and being a, a helpful ear, ear for, for your neighbours as well. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Grant. Okay. Thanks, Diane. I'm going to uh, move the presentation over here to Grant. Just uh, give us a second here and... Uh, we will do that. In the meantime, I'll just remind you that if you have a question, just uh, type it into that question box on your GoToWebinar panel, and uh, I'll and, and I'll uh, ask the questions um, when Grant's done. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over. Oops. Uh, okay, Grant, you want to uh, click that display settings up in the top there because we are seeing your. Um, uh, presentation there on the um, the so we have to switch your display a little bit here Grant and Dean I've got all most problems <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, hang on here I wonder if this will help it all right hang on now um, just go to display settings on your screen there Where pray tell is that, Dean? Oh, you just went, you just went out there. Sorry, people. We're uh, we'll uh, get get technical him back here. Difficulties. Yeah, a little technical difficulties, but that's okay. Okay, so up in the top there, top bar it says display settings. Just a I, I can't see display settings. Should be on one screen there. Oh yes. So now I'm that. seeing it. Yeah, click. Go ahead and uh, swap. Where it says swap. Okay, 
and go for it. We can see. What Alrighty. You Thank you. Okay. Well, it's certainly been a challenging year all the way around. So uh, a group of us decided that we'd uh, try to do our best to draw on some of the gray hair and experience we've got already. And as you can see, as we look across Canada, um, Western Canada in particular, to get a feel for the bigger picture. And as Diane was talking to you about, where do they have adequate moisture? Where do things look better? And I'm believing when I look at this, that the white areas on that Agriculture Agri-Food Canada map as of June 15th were areas that were more promising. And of course, then we head to the areas that were less and the red being the greatest concern areas. I will share a couple of other maps because it kind of sets the stage for where we're going here as we look across this uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And when we looked early this spring up until the end of May, there was a lot of areas in Alberta that were struggling. And as you can see, the moisture that we had a bit in the fall that delayed the grain harvest was not adequate after the long dry summer that we'd had. So all perennial forages really struggled this spring combined with cool weather. And that cool weather really slowed things down. Um, but as of May 31st, this is how Alberta looked. And then when I looked at what Saskatchewan's map was pulled together, and the dark brown area is the most deficient area as you can see. There's a large area in Saskatchewan as of June 24th um, that from April to June cumulative rainfall was very low. And so we were looking at that leading into the fact that there's a whole area across Western Canada that is in the same pickle, if you want to call it, but there are pockets within it that aren't. And now, once we got to July 2nd here in Alberta, all of a sudden things started to look a lot better. I've got to admit that it came a little late, and with that coming late, it set the stage for a bit of compensatory growth, but it also maybe gave us an opportunity for some salvage crops because the grain industry might well, as I look at the annual side, might well in fact have a situation where there is feed available. Um, it's just not what the grain people want and maybe it is what the cattle people want. So my thought on that is we've got some areas to look at and doing our diligence now, um, looking as Diane shared, some of these forage and applied research associations, depending on membership and other things, it's a great resource to call and ask, um, is there anybody within our area that's looking for to do something with salvage crops? And that might well be a case where a person's going to be able to find um, the improvement that came too late for the grain farmer, might well be the salvage crop that is the feed resource for the cattle producer. And looking at a bit of creative solution ideas, I know it's July and July is rolling along. And needless to say, you never know what's out there around you. And so we've made a few phone calls and dug in, tried to see what we can come up with for you. And the fact is that in times of greater moisture, as you can see in this slide that um, Graham Finn shared, um, there the cropland that is on your right is land that the grain farmer is pretty disappointed about. But lo and behold, that's one of the things that uh, a lot of the Forage and Applied Research Associations and many of the scientists have been working on. What happens if we address soil health? What happens if, as on the left, where Graham's wintered his cattle with swath grazing now for a number of years, the organic matter's higher. So when you look from one side of the road to the other, it isn't so much soil difference in terms of soil type, but the higher organic matter potentially, the land that's got a little more life in it potentially can absorb and take in that water. So maybe we've got an option for some grain farmers that are disappointed with some of their land that 
a livestock producer might be able to convince them to do a bit of seeding on, um, maybe come into some of those areas and try to improve them even though it's dry. And that's where a lot of the work coming out of the US and other places out of SARE, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Extension Group out down there is very similar to our Forage and Applied Research Associations up here and forage councils and uh, extension staff looking at addressing the variable weather in terms of, hey, what if we had better soils? What if our soils were more suited to deal with this? Could we in fact have better crops? And that's something we'll go dig a little bit into right now. Many of you know, and maybe even attended the BCRC webinar that Jillian Baynard did, and Dr. Mike Schellenberg had both done looking at multi-species and some of the benefits from it. And I've had long conversations with Dr. Schellenberg about this over the years, and we're finding things don't add up. And that's the part of it that's kind of exciting at times, because it doesn't add up. And then you ask yourself, why? And as Dr. Schellenberg helps me with it, understanding it, there's some things here I think that we find that are occurring that we don't think about. The fact is this also by Dr. Akeem Omankahe up at the Fairview team with the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association with Dr. Bart Lardner and others looked from Saskatchewan, looked at multi-species annual crop mixes. So he looked at monocultural cereals um, all the way to 12 species mixes to see what would happen. And lo and behold, he looked at it, and that article in the bottom is something that any of uh, extension people can get to you if you're really interested in it. But what Akeem found was that a minimum of three species was needed to really increase annual production over one or two. And so he found the highest yielding species were in fact ones that were three species mixes and more. And when we looked at that, he looked at it with economics, with quality and quantity. So it's an excellent research paper, as my friend Lauren Klein said to me. Soil health nuggets. There's some amazing things happening underground with some of this. And this is where the sales pitch to the grain farmer about integrating livestock and looking at it from a standpoint of good management, not looking at it from a standpoint of um, the animals on the land to benefit the land, not to compact the land, not to in fact pug it. But this that was written in the USDA, I think did a great job of summing it up. Multiple bennies, and I, we're not talking drugs here for those of you that are like me a little bit older and understand this, but benefits. And when we see some of it, what's exciting to me is by allowing crops to flourish in dry times while monoculture struggle. And that's exciting because accelerating biological time by increasing organic matter. I'm gonna share some pieces with you that address some of this and that's why some of this diverse crop cover crop mixtures add to a solution that could be in a solution that's adopted in the longer term i'm not going to say to you go whole hog here be careful but we're looking at trying to understand some of the science behind it some of the practice behind it some of the extension behind it and some of the results that Akeem found in Fairview um, and others are finding at Swift Current and elsewise. Now, Diane, of course, talked on the perennial side, but she's done a lot of work on the annual side and Dr. Jamili Zavala and the whole CARA, Chinook Applied Research Association team have. And they, in July, of 2015 when things were so dry, the triticale monoculture was very disappointing. And I know a friend of mine, Kevin Elmy, was saying when Christine Jones being in Saskatchewan last week, she used this example saying a monoculture 
And triticale is well known for its moisture ability to tolerate drought and other things. But the intriguing thing is this is at the same site. And where we looked at a monoculture, now we start looking at a cocktail. Well, what is going on here? And Dr. Yamili Zavala, who many of you will get to meet over time, exciting and passionate person about soils with tremendous experience over time, working in soils labs and at Cornell. So we've got a tremendous re local resource and a soils lab re local resource here. But that same area, that monoculture triticale crop we just looked at, neighboring another crop that's a mixture. And Dr. Mike Schellenberg will call it hydraulic lift often. How some of the deeper rooted plants will lift moisture up in it. And as you can see, that's triticale that's headed out. Why was it so poor in the other plot? Why is it doing so well in this one? They were seeded at the same time. And I believe that was in June. But the fact is that the ability for deeper rooted plants and maybe even lower disease levels between plants in a monoculture, Dr. Schellenberg said to me, might be part of it. There's a number of things going on that we don't have all the answers for, but the proof is in the pudding. The fact is, in the very dry conditions, do you want that triticale crop? And I really like triticale, so I'm not picking on it. I'm just saying, do you want a monoculture or do you want some friends around to help you? And that's why, as we talked about, be it neighbors, forage and applied research associations, they're there for that same purpose, learning and sharing and getting a higher yield in the end to address our own needs. Some of it can be pretty basic. Because where do you, and somebody might say to me, where are you supposed to find barley or oats right now? Well, maybe it isn't seed barley or oats. Maybe it is what is the tail end of things that have been put in a bin between air seeders. Maybe it is a bit of the crop that was left from last year. But mixing a spring and winter cereal together, now you've got an ability for growth and ground cover and having a higher leaf area index to capture solar energy. And remember the synergy we saw in the other. This is just two species in this mix at Lacombe that um, uh, Arvid Austin put together with Dr. Vern Barron back then. But they did find many benefits in terms of having your cake and eat it too. Have your silage, then a regrowth crop. And that's what Kevin Elmy showed me, where he'd green feeded the oats that was on it. Then lo and behold, you can see the annual ryegrass. And I'm not a big fan of Italian or annual ryegrass in drought because I don't find they perform like the winter grain cereals do, or maybe even like a perennial ryegrass might. But the fact is it's green, it's still got potential to grow. And the brassica that's in there too, that we can see is still green. So let's look a little deeper at this. What we're trying to do in all of this is stack. And we're trying to stack the yield that comes with an early season growth and try to spread it out a little bit more. And as we saw with the Italian ryegrass, or if we would with a winter cereal, we're spreading out the yield, the green season of growth over a longer season. And some of these plants have greater tolerances or plasticity, I guess is the word, for being able to keep coming. Like a brassica will go a bit dormant on you, but when the moisture comes, away it comes, instead of withering and dying on you. And so that's one of the benefits people are finding with the brassicas. And then the fall seeded crops, taking advantage of the cereals that can really grow late into the fall. And that of course is a benefit to a fall or winter cereal, also to a brassica that can tolerate, like uh, wintry um, uh, rape can tolerate down to almost minus 10 degrees Celsius and still grow and stay green and maintain its cell integrity. 
and some crops that it can even grow into next year because it is a 365 day nutritional system that Diane was talking to you about too. And so any chance we can plant something to be earlier growing in the spring and it's not going to grow without water, I'm not saying it won't, but will, I guess, sorry there. But the fact is it has an ability to go ahead and grow when the moisture comes to deal with that. Lauren had said to me that my good friend Lauren Klein from Weyburn, Saskatchewan, and many of you know him with Sask Egg, with all the years of experience. Once you got later in the year, the work he'd done in this ADOPT project and others that Wally Vannon had done before him showed that the millets really came on, and Diane talked about that. C4 plants, like millets, like corn, uh, sunflowers, other plants too have an ability to function on a little less water. They have a very immense root system too and go deep into the soil. So what Lauren found when he seeded June 28th, that the millets actually gave better yield than the barley or oat crops. And so the benefit of them, Kevin Elmy says be careful because June 28th, to the middle of July are big days. So where millets, and I know in talking to the millet king, uh, there is red prozo around. I know other companies, seed companies are carrying other millets like Golden German, that Lauren. Lauren also had red prozo, I didn't put it in example. But we have a window of time for the millets to go in. Their small seeds, be careful. The, Golden Germans, very different seed size than the Prozo. So the seed rate you use should reflect the seed size. It's got to be seeded shallow. It's not oats or barley. You can't be seeding it that deep. But as Lauren found with it, it's an advantage. And it's an advantage that doesn't tolerate frost. So you got to be careful. Where does it fit? If you're down in the part of the country with good heat units and not early frost, the millets might be a really good advantage for you. The cocktail cover crops, and I don't want to spend a bunch of time on this slide, it's going to be there on when you revisit what's present on this webinar. You're looking at combining multifunctional species, and you're looking at one plus one plus one plus one doesn't equal four. In the past so many times we and I know myself with so favoritism for monocultures, but we're finding that's not the case. We're finding now that those mixtures, but be careful thought mixtures, plant the right things. Maybe you do not plant a lot of brassica. One pound of brassica might be all you put in a mix and be careful that it be shallow because the benefit of it is there, but maybe we need the cool season grasses, and by that I mean the cereals like oats, barley, triticale, fall rye, or spring rye, or the winter ones, winter rye or, or fall rye there. And the nitrogen fixers, the legumes. Got to be careful a bit there because as cost goes, ability to fix, um, it is an advantage. They are a vif very different uh, bird you bring into the plate. And that is one of the benefits we're finding. The sweet clovers are gaining in popularity. It's something that can overwinter and have potential next year and can be killed out with an early glyphosate operation or, in fact, amend the soil, as Dr. Martin Entz had shown in Manitoba, for many years after even for benefits of root depth going into the ground. Now, this was a picture seeded on July the 1st and a picture on September 16th that uh, Kevin Elmy had shared with me. And the fact of we've got brassicas down here, we've got a little bit of sunflower. You don't have to have a lot. It's a buck 66 a pound, helps with snow catch. Um, it's a, a C4, but it functions a little more like a C3 at times, Kevin informs me. But the fact is the millet's in there, got to watch because an early frost, a bit of a frost can really hamper the millets and stop them quick. 
This is one that was seeded the middle of July. And this oat radish mix, and you can see there's not a lot of radish there, a lot of oats. And in August 8th, that's what you saw. And you're thinking, oh boy, you know, um, that's still a while. But that, that picture that was from the seeding of July, I've got something wrong here. Uh, the picture was actually taken September uh, uh, 8th. I've got a wrong date there, Dean, I'll have to fix. So it isn't August 8th picture, it's September 8th or it's September 16th. My apologies, I remember the exact date. It is a September 16th picture. That's a pretty nice crop. That's a crop that's heading towards now a silage, round bale silage, very high quality supplement maybe to go with a lot of straw so you can ration it out. And as Dan talked to you about the kids doing something with electric fence in the summer, maybe it's something you're going to be doing in the late fall. Taking advantage of this oat radish mix in September or October, maybe a tenth of a ration is all you're going to need because it's going to be so high quality to go with a poor quality ration if calves are weaned or such. But again, September 16th is the right date. I'll change this before you others get it. Um, whoops, I'm rolling backwards here. August 1st seeding. And again, this is something that Graham Finn had shared. And August 1st seeded, September 1st picture. We're looking at barley with a couple of brassicas, that being a rape and a turnip. Goliath rape does well in dry conditions and hunter turnip both do well in dry conditions. Some others don't. But as you're seeing that coming on September 1st, it's heading towards being a suitable crop with some, with some frost tolerance to be something. And that's that crop on in a swath now on October 31st. So the realization as Graham shared is that you can have some very high quality swath grazing now maybe to put with a poor quality straw that you can buy from quite a few neighbors around more readily and ration this, treat it like gold with the high price of grain, maybe instead of pellets, maybe instead of barley, you're gonna be in fact using your cocktail crops or high quality cereal mixes with winter mix with spring as their supplement. And again, another to give you hope, September, August 1st seeded and September 1st, so depending on moisture, there is an opportunity. This is another one to show you where Diane seeded back in June when they did that in September 1st and where Christine Jones was so impressed with that other stand. This is a later picture taken of one of the other stands. As you can see, whether it's a faba bean or such in with the sunflower, that crop is giving you some pretty good yield coming your way. So don't lose sight of the mixes. Don't go whole hog. You don't have to buy a lot, but if you're saying, I can't find seed, I can't find enough oats or barley, do take advantage because I do know these companies do have seed. I know Alberta Beef even had an ad. So one of the companies was selling seed. And so any of your local companies probably that are in the seed selling business of annuals now have got seed available for you better this time of year than your older barley people might have. Because very simply said, they want to market to you for a later season growth as Diane had mentioned. All these associations to take advantage of their phone numbers and also the resources. And I certainly in my life have lived with a lot of learnings. And as I learn from others, um, what I do today, I want to know more tomorrow. And the mistakes I make today, nobody will remember tomorrow. Um, unless they're too big, I guess. But my thought to all of this is draw on keeping yourself strong. If you're not strong, if your families aren't strong, then you are not going to be making the best decisions too. And take time for yourself this summer in a summer of stress and such to still find time to be a family and communicate together draw on those long distance relationships as we showed with the maps across the province. 
you might be able to haul some feed a long ways, depending on who you're talking to. Be careful as Dan talked to you about weeds. Know the weight of your feed, pay per ton. Try to do your feed test. And that's another webinar that's coming up as this series is going to continue through this summer and setting you up more. Draw on your Saskatchewan resources because you've got some amazing ones we draw on regularly. And I know we work as a team more than you think behind the scenes. And so taking advantage of this, taking advantage of your own health and building things there. And there is more to it. There are opportunities for the future that give us even a stronger ability to deal with variable weather conditions. And that heads towards um, addressing soil health. I firmly believe there are some opportunities there. And I shamelessly I'll plug one of the events that the Forage and Applied Research Association, several in Alberta are working towards putting on with speakers from across Canada, Saskatchewan and Alberta and into the States that'll be coming up and it's on the, up on the website already. So I'll close it there, Dean. Thank you. Good, thanks Grant. Excellent presentation. And uh, as well, Diane, excellent presentation as well. Um, we do have a couple of questions here and uh, for anybody else, just uh, feel free to type in your questions at the uh, with the question box. Uh, first one is from uh, Jillian Patton Oden. We're gonna leave the, the mics open for both of them so they can answer them. Um, where can we get dugout water tested? Uh, I can answer that. Uh, we've uh, facilitated uh, a lot of samples for producers. Uh, we we ship to A and L labs in Ontario, and it's pretty reasonable price. I think it's um, depending on the the degree of of uh, detail you want, but uh, between forty and sixty dollars a sample for livestock use, and it's a really quick turnaround. Has been our experience to this point. Anything to add, Grant, or is that good? No, I think all your associations across the province, of course, just like Diane, work with producers. And we do have water engineers, water quality specialists. And in fact, that was exactly something I'd sent to Brandon Lessig. Uh, at least, sorry, my apologies, Brandon. At, uh, so we do have specialists across the province, as Saskatchewan does too, that you can draw on. Um, and ask those type of questions. So yeah, call the association or just call 310 Farm and away you roll or the Ag Knowledge Center. Yeah, and and the specialists have been really uh, responsive. Like quickly, we've often, you know, forwarded the the results and and able they're able to make a connection and and provide uh, some really valuable information right away. Okay, excellent. Um, next question is from Dale Engstrom. What are C3 and C4 crops? They have, I'll try to give that one a little bit of an answer. The, they have a different set of um, specialties, if you want to call it that. How they uh, capture carbon, how they uh, convert that, how they in fact function. We need a warmer climate for a C4. It likes that heat and it can really grow to town. And no pun intended, it is true, grow to town. So a very good comment Dale made. The C3 is like 20 degrees Celsius, maybe 15 degrees Celsius weather, and they do very well. Once we start getting over 20, they start overheating a little bit. So the ability for a C4 plant in how it respires and functions, it releases less water through the guard cells when it's respiring. So it is better able, if I got this right, better able to be more water use efficient and at the same time tolerate the heat. And so you're trying to combine things so you'll have your cake and eat it too in terms of take advantage of the heat when water is short but C4 still need water. It just, they can, if they get water in a timely enough manner, and if you get a bit of that August rains and you've still got that heat that July, from June 21st till the middle of August, C4s will really jump and come from for you. 
and but if you don't get it they won't the c3s are more spring to early summer and later fall and the c3s are your typical perennial plants we're so familiar here in many parts of alberta the typical annual plants we're so familiar with the c4s end up being the new things we look at like corn millet sunflower um, and I know I'm missing some, but those type of crops that um, are maybe a little more new to us. Good, thank you. Um, Diane, anything to add? Or? No, I think Grant explained it much better than I could have. So. Yep. So no more questions in the queue here. So just uh, any other comments, uh, Diane, that come to mind after Grant's presentation? Uh, no, I think he, he covered it really well. I think, you know, the, the main gist is that there definitely are options out there and, um, you know, it's it's not too late to to uh, pursue some of them. Grant, any other comments that you'd like to make that, uh, that you think that you may have uh, overlooked? It's just uh, the the fact of the matter is acting quickly and uh, drawing on resources quickly. And we've given you some, and those ones, as Diane had commented, how fast they are getting back. I think it took Brandon two hours before he had my answers for me, so I was really lucky. And that's the fact is that we're, those resources you've got, those networks you've got, um, a phone call's just a phone call, an email's just an email. There's some great, drought resources on BCRC. Janice Brune has put some excellent things for foragebeef.ca. If many of you really valued it, Janice and the Beef Cattle Research Council have done a marvelous job getting things up as fast as possible. So they've got some excellent drought uh, cover crop information already up and going for you and pasture information to draw on as well as your local uh, websites in Saskatchewan, Alberta, or Manitoba for that matter. Okay, excellent. Well, I don't see any more questions, so uh, looks like we've covered it. So uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Diane and Grant for our excellent uh, presentations. A uh, couple of things here, um, like I said before, the, the webinar is being recorded, so you can uh, view it at a later time. Uh, there will be a survey popping up after the uh, after the webinar closes here. So we would like to hear your comments about this webinar and any other topics that you would like to see us cover in these webinars. And uh, just a reminder that we are going to be running these webinars every second Thursday uh, during this, uh, the summer into in September and October. So the next one will be July 18th. Uh, we'll have um, Ted Nyberg and I believe Jason Wood. They're going to talk about some feeding economics. So um, put that one in your calendar and watch out for and watch for the rest of the the series coming up. Uh, there is an article in Agri News that has is out about uh, the titles for the upcoming uh, webinars. So with that, uh, we will close the webinar and I'd like to thank you for uh, coming out this evening. Thanks. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks, everyone.